everyone. Welcome to Scale uh, 2023, um, and welcome to the Postgres track. So we have two uh, set of talks every day, and our first speaker is Magnus Hegander. He's a core team member, and he's going to talk about the upcoming features. I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the current features in Postgres 15. Thank you. <coughs> sorry, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. I'm going to give the microphone for you to you, and you can ask the questions anytime you want. Thank you. <coughs> okay, thank you, Javram. And good morning, everyone. Uh, I was going to say I'm glad to see so many of you get up this early, but it's really not that early, is it? That's kind of convenient. Do like, and I'm uh, glad to be back here at scale. Uh, my last presentation at scale was, I guess, well, technically the presentation I think was on the Friday, and then on like the Tuesday the world shut down because of COVID. So um, I'm very glad to be back. I didn't make it back last year for the, the summer scale. Uh, this part of the time just works better for me. And I think I gave actually at the time the same talk, but uh, for a different version of Oscars, of course, because luckily, while all of our abilities to attend this type of conferences and stuff got shut down, our abilities to keep building database servers did not. Uh, and we kept pushing out approximately a version a year of Postgres. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk about Postgres 15. Uh, that's the version that is out there that you can be using today. Uh, if you want to be more you know, living on the edge tomorrow, I will give basically the same talk but about the upcoming version of Postgres that does not actually exist. So it'll be a lot more speculation then. Uh, this is about stuff that actually does exist uh, in Postgres 15. Actually, who's already using Postgres 15 in production today? Okay, well, it's not that many. <clears throat> and I recognize several of you as being Postgres contributors, so I'm not sure how much you count in that particular question. Um, a few words about me. Uh, as Devram said, for Postgres, I'm a member of the Postgres core team. Uh, I'm one of the committers, though in fairness, I didn't do much for Postgres 15. Uh, and I'm serving as president of the board for Postgres Europe, which is the uh, European mirror sort of of the Postgres US organization. The Postgres US organization is the one that's putting on these two days of Postgres tracks during scale. Uh, when I'm not doing, you know, Postgres community work, uh, I work for a company called Red Pill Linpro. Uh, we're an open source services business in Scandinavia. So I'm based out of Stockholm in Sweden myself. Uh, so enough about me, let's talk about Postgres. Uh, and specifically about Postgres 15. Uh, so first of all, Postgres 15 started working. If you've seen, uh, if anyone of you seen me do these talks before, yes, I have the same timeline. It has been surprisingly consistent. Postgres targets a re major release once a year. Uh, and we split up the development schedule of these releases in something that we call commit fests, which is just you know, our term for how we do iterative development. We, in theory, everything's in theory, right? In theory, we spend a month building features, and then we spend a month reviewing those features and committing them to Postgres. Now, the terminology commit fest really comes from the way uh, that the Postgres project uses the term committer, which is based on the old days of CVS and SVN. Right? Uh, today, in the world of Git, what we're really talking about is merging. But you know, terminology, we still call it the commit fest. Uh, so for Postgres 15, work really started in June of 2021, uh, which is when we branched off what was then supposed to become Postgres 14. And we just declared, I, I just like the way that we do this part in Postgres, right? We just create a branch in Git and we name it release 14 stable. And that way it's stable. Like you should try that with your software. Like if, if you can't really finish like testing and all that stuff, just create a branch called stable and everything will be fine. Uh, and then we kept going. We had a commit fest in July, in September, in November, in January, and in March. Uh, in June, we had uh, the beta version out, and then we had the release version out. I say I forgot to update my slides when we put out the release version. I've given this talk several times since we did that, and I always forget it. We put the release out at the beginning of October, which is the target for these Postgres releases. You can expect a new major version of Postgres approximately in the September-October timeframe uh, of every year. 
So what did we put in there? I usually try to, when I make these presentations, I try to split them up a bit. I talk about DBA and administration feature. Uh, I talk about SQL and developer features. And then, you know, we're happy to have a you know, debate over beer tonight discussing what really is the difference between a DBA and a developer in today's world. Are these really separate roles? But I just, you know, SQL is things exposed at the SQL level. Uh, then we talk specifically about backup and replication features. And of course, everybody's favorite performance. But before we get there, things that break. Okay, Postgres 15 is not one of the bad ones. We've had a couple of releases that has caused a lot of grief in breaking changes. The, there aren't many of those uh, in Postgres 15. Postgres front-end tools have dropped support for Postgres older than 9.2. Who's using Postgres older than 9.2? Like, please, no hands? Okay, good. Like, this is really old stuff. But yes, if you were using Postgres 9.2, like, you, you've lost, you've now lost the ability because the, the way we do upgrades in Postgres from, say, 9.1 to Postgres 14 is you would use PG dump from Postgres 14. You can no longer do this with 15, so you would now have to do your upgrades in multiple steps. But of course, you shouldn't be using such an old version of Postgres. It's been end of life for many years. We've dropped support for Python 2 in PL Python. This one I've actually had a couple of my uh, own customers run into. Most of them ran into this problem when Debian and Ubuntu dropped support or, uh, for Python 2, which happened earlier. But the entire language of Python 2 went end of life in January 2020. So if you have, and you want to do this upgrade, if you have stored procedures in PL Python 2, uh, the way to do it is upgrade them to PL Python 3 in your old version of Postgres. And then get rid of PL Python 2 and then upgrade. Because once you are uh, going to Postgres 15, it's just not there. Now the thing that really might break some applications, and actually it should, uh, is the public schema. Uh, the, as you know, there is a role in Postgres called public that every user gets automatically, uh, becomes a member of when they log in. This role used to have permissions to create objects in the schema named public. It no longer has that. So that means any user in Postgres, if you didn't do anything in particular, you just did a create user, they could create tables in the public schema. They can't do that anymore. Uh, only the role PG database owner can do that. Uh, so you need to assign explicit permissions. Now, requiring the assignment of explicit permissions for people to create things is actually a good thing, but it may break things. Right? It turns out this will not be a problem if you read an old Postgres security alert from years ago which told you to revoke this permission, and if you then also remember to do that on every database you installed since then, which you probably didn't. Um, Public, the, the role public does retain usage permissions, so we only restrict them from creating objects in the public schema. They can still use the objects if they're in there, provided they have permissions on the individual object. Another thing to remember about this one is upgrades. If you upgrade to Postgres 15, the old permissions will be included in the upgrade, so you will have to go in and actually remove this yourself. But if you do a new install on Postgres 15, then you will get these new permissions. And Postgres has finally removed the idea of exclusive backup mode. This is a special way to run the uh, file-based backups in Postgres. It has been deprecated for something like 10 years, uh, and now it's actually removed. Uh, if you are using uh, one of the you know, major backup tools for Postgres, like PG Backrest or Barman or one of these tools, They've all been upgraded to use the proper APIs years ago. You will not have a problem. If you wrote your own backup scripts, well, this is an excellent time to replace them with one of the backup tools. That is much better than your scripts. They are certainly much better than my scripts uh, because they are often not using that. Or if you use the tool PG Base Backup, um, it has, from its very creation, only used the non-exclusive mode. Uh, but old backup scripts may break, so make sure you double check that. Okay, so that's things we broke. Let's look at things that we added. That's really, you don't upgrade just to get the things we break, right? You, you usually upgrade to get uh, something that's useful. 
A <coughs> um, couple of smaller things on the DPA and admin things. Uh, this is one of those, you go, when I looked at this, I also, as many others were like, that's not a headline feature, and then I realized how common it is. So libpq, the Postgres client side program, didn't use to allow your SSL private keys to be owned by root. The server did, but not the client. And it turns out in these days of you know, containerized worlds, we run a lot more things as root than we used to do. And it's no longer the same kind of problem that it used to be. So this will just work now, just makes life easier. Uh, you may have caught through uh, a couple of releases, Postgres has been adding something we call predefined roles. These are just global roles that we add to the Postgres system that you can grant to your users instead of giving them super user. The long-term goal here is to chip away so that you never have to grant super user to anyone because super user is very dangerous. Uh, a new one in Postgres 15 is just called PG Checkpoint that allows this user to run checkpoints. Uh, prior versions of Postgres required super user to do that. Um, small thing useful in some cases, it also shows this pattern of there is a progress. Postgres 16 will do more on this and we keep adding more of these roles because don't ever grant super user to anyone, preferably not yourself either. Um, we have the ability, uh, a very basic permission systems on GUX, wonderful Postgres terminal. Who actually knows what a GUX is when I write it like this? Okay, I see two, pe one, two people who are not known Postgres contributors. Uh, so GUC is one of those silly things. In Postgres, we like to talk about them. Everybody knows what they mean. These are configuration parameters. I think the name comes from something like Grand Unified Configuration from years ago when Postgres used to have all these things split up in different sections for you as a user and in different sections in the code for processing them and it was all unified and then they were named internally in Postgres Grand Unified Configuration. And we still call them GUCs and that's silly. Uh, but what we do let you do is we let you reduce permissions on super user GUX. What does that mean? Well, it means that we can set, change the requirements. For example, the parameter track functions require super user to change it. Well, in Postgres 15, you can now say grant set on parameter track functions to Joe. Now Joe can change this parameter. You can only go one way. You can't restrict things, like you can't revoke it, but you can grant them. So something that previously required super user no longer requires super user. Uh, and you can also grant alter system, which will allow the user to make a permanent change to this parameter. You know, grant alter system on parameter track functions to Joe lets Joe do alter system set and change this parameter uh, in a permanent fashion. So again, the small things would chip away at removing the need to be super user because we really don't like that. Useful parameters added for memory sizing that are not parameters that you set. These are, we're just using the parameter system as a way for you to get a value. We have something called shared memory size that if you show this parameter, uh, you will be told what's the total requirement of shared memory of Postgres right now. For the main server with all of its difference, so this is not just shared buffers. You'd go like, well, I already have shared buffers, but Postgres puts other things in shared memory as well. Extensions can put things in shared memory. Things like that, they're included in this. And then you have shared memory size in huge pages. Don't you love these parameter names? <laughs> it's a wonderful thing, right? Designed by committee. Uh, how many huge pages would you need to do this? And this has been a, a classic problem in, in Postgres, right? If you look, it, it's almost embarrassing. If you look in the documentation and you go like, oh, if you want to enable huge pages, it's basically you know, run this command, look at the error message and reconfigure the system based on the error message by looking at some things in slash proc and things. So Postgres can now do this for you and tell you how many huge pages you need to get this working. Uh, and combining this with the dash C functionality to the Postgres binary means that you can show these values without actually starting the server. So you can, in this case, in the bottom example here, for example, Postgres C shared memory size in huge pages, 72 says for this server to start, you need 72 huge pages available and configured in your system. So let's get those, you can put this into your pipelines and things like that to see, how, because th that's of course the number that you need to configure your kernel uh, to make things work. Uh, moving on then, PG stat statements 
I'll just do that one again. Who in here is using PG stat statements today? Okay, getting a couple more. The rest of you, if you haven't looked at it, you really should look at PG stat statements. It is an excellent extension, uh, ships as part of the standard server, uh, but you need to enable it separately to let you know what's going on in your system. Uh, Postgres 15 will add IO timing values for temp files, uh, and it will add JIT counters and how much time and how many times different parts of JIT has been activated in the system. Uh, and on the statistics side, we have some new wait events. I think these are self-explanatory, right? Wait event archive command, well, it's set when the archive command is running. The restore command is set when the restore command is running. So it just gives you a few more ways. But if you're keeping a list of, of wait events that you're tracking somewhere, uh, add these new ones. Uh, we have some important changes to logging. First of all, the Postgres startup process. So when Postgres is, well, starting, or if it's crashing and coming back up from a crash, <coughs> will now tell you what it's doing. It will do so every log startup process interval seconds, by default 10 seconds. So if Postgres takes longer than 10 seconds to start, it will start logging, telling you what's going on. Telling you that, oh, I'm still recovering from the transaction log. You know, please hold on. So you don't have to sit there and go like, is it doing something? Did it hang? Where's my database? Am I gonna get fired? Um, we'll also change the default values of log auto vacuum in duration to 10 minutes, which means that every one of your auto vacuum processes triggering off in the background, if they take longer than 10 minutes, it'll go in the log file. And we've turned on log checkpoints by default, which means in the default configuration, you will now get a line in the log every five minutes telling you about the checkpoint status. Um, these are probably, in most ways, good defaults, but you just need to be ready for them that suddenly, if, if, you, if you're one of those people who you know, put filters in and set alerts whenever things show up in the log file that you didn't know before, like, yes, things will now show up in the log file. Uh, the fact that these checkpoint logs or auto vacuum logs show up is not a problem. Perfectly normal. Doesn't mean you have a problem. Um, we have a new logging format. Uh, the configuration of it is, it's again one of my pet peeves because I think it's really stupid the way we do that in Postgres. Sorry to the people who did it, but you set log destination to JSON log and then you get a file uh, and it will be in JSON format. Uh, we've basically overloaded the destination and the format into the same parameter. Uh, there are technical reasons for why we're doing that. Uh, I just think it's silly. So, you know, I use my chance to stand up here and tell you that I think it's silly. It works exactly the same way as the CSV log format. If you're using that today, you set log destination equals CSV log, and you got your log files in, in the CSV file, and now you get it in a JSON file. Uh, we have a lot of our modern uh, log management softwares that really like to ingest JSON because every log row has its own schema included. Uh, so if you're working uh, with one of those systems, logging natively in JSON can just make your life uh, a lot easier in dealing with those. We've added something that we call security invoker views. By default, a view in SQL and a view in Postgres will run with the permissions of the view's owner. So if I create a view that joins two tables, if you query, if, and I give you permission to query my view, your permissions will be checked against the view, but when the underlying tables will be checked with my permissions. That's what we actually call a security definer and that's the default, and that's the only thing we've had for views before. Now I can say create view with security invoker equals true, at which point it will actually use your permissions to check the underlying table permissions as well. Uh, a fun functionality, uh, much more interesting where I'm from in Europe than usually in the US. You know, we have an entire world outside of ASCII and American sorting orders. Uh, Postgres has supported ICU for a while. Uh, in uh, 15, you will now be able to set a global locale provider on a per cluster or database level to an ICU locale. Uh, normally, if you don't do this, Postgres will use whatever locale provider your operating system has. So on a Linux machine, it'll be the glibc locale provider. Uh, ICU gives you a lot more availability. It does give you things that are also interesting, uh, even in places where, you know, you mainly deal with this. You can get case-insensitive locales, you can get accent-insensitive sorting and things like that. 
uh, are provided by ICU, and you can now set them as a, a global, global default locale provider. Okay, let's take a look at a few things at the SQL level. Um, we got some interesting things. I think one of these are actually really useful. The other one is mostly interesting. So numeric, you know, the data type numeric. If you're not using integers or floating, you're using numeric, which is a fixed, uh, fixed precision, very large numbers, for example. You can now specify them with a negative scale. What does that mean? Well, traditionally, when we define numeric, it's the data type is numeric, parentheses, and then you have precision, comma, scale where precision is the number of significant digits that you want, and scale is the number of digits to the right of the decimal point. Right, so in the example here, if you're saying numeric 5 comma 1, it means five, uh, five uh, significant digits of which one is a decimal. So, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, point zero. A classic would be if you're dealing, you know, dealing in dollars and cents, you would have something comma 2, because you want exactly two decimals and, and it will handle the rounding, right? Uh, if you have a numeric something comma zero, you've basically got an integer. Right? Generally speaking, don't do that unless your number will not fit in a 64-bit number. We all know 64 bits is going to be enough for everyone, right? Uh, but if your numbers fit within a 64-bit number, if you use the integer data types, they will be much, much, much faster than numeric. But sometimes you have to, right? And the new thing here is you can specify a scale of negative one or negative five, right? That just means that it will remove the round off uh, to the left of the decimal point. So the five comma minus one, you see, it'll do one, two, three, and then the last digit will always be zero, and it'll round them off. And if it was uh, you know, numeric five comma minus two, the value would be one, two, zero, zero. Uh, you can also uh, strangely make the scale greater than the precision. So you can actually, you can have more decimal digits than you have precision. So in this case, you will find this is why you get 0 0.010, that you have three, your precision is three, even though your scale, uh, sorry, your, your scale is three, even though your precision is two. I, I haven't really personally found a use case for that one, but I'm sure there is one. Uh, if you are using uh, foreign keys, you can now set part, you do a partial set null. So pri previously, what you could typically do is, you know, you have a foreign key, references the other table, and you can say on delete set null. So when you delete the key, uh, then all the three columns would be set to null in the referencing table. Now you can say actually only set column two and column three to null, and leave column one at whatever value it was. Uh, this turns out to be really useful if you're having like multi-tenant systems, where you might have one column that's you know, customer ID, and then the other ones are the real reference that you care about. You want the customer ID to remain so that this uh, the record in the other table doesn't suddenly get uh, orphaned from which customer it belongs to. So a useful addition to on delete. And then we have, this one is fun. So uh, unique constraints versus nulls. Anyone who's ever migrated systems between databases knows that this can be really fun because different databases do it differently. Uh, so assume this case, you know, create table u a int unique. Okay, we're putting unique values in this table. We insert the value one. Then we insert the value null. Then we insert the value null. What happens? Right, there are two possible outcomes here, right? Either it says everything's fine, or it says unique violation. You can't do this. Okay, who goes for it goes in, everything's fine. Okay, who goes for unique violation? Okay, a bit fewer people. Who goes for, I have no idea, that's too complicated for me. Okay, there you go. So uh, you can tell from this which databases people are coming from, right? Uh, what Postgres does in this case is it allows it. Uh, SQL Server, for example, does it the other way around. Really annoying. Uh, now, the SQL standard now has a way to deal with, and that's what we've added in Postgres 15, which is you can now say unique nulls not distinct. Okay? By default, Postgres consider, considers the nulls to be distinct. So if you install, insert five different nulls, well, if you insert null five times, Postgres consider it to be five different nulls. 
But if you say null's not distinct, it means suddenly that in the uniqueness check, null equals null. And we do the same, we insert the u, we insert the null, we insert the null, and now we actually get a uniqueness fail. I've seen a fair amount of systems that have bugged out that relied on this behavior when they were migrated into Postgres, and the developers did not realize that this is not how Postgres behaves. So this is a way, I'd say this is mostly useful when you are migrating uh, systems from databases that behave in a different way. Uh, but that could also be that I'm colored by how Postgres has done this forever, and I think that's just better. Um, and then, of course, on the SQL level, it's, it's hard to get by without the main headline feature on the SQL level of Postgres 15, which is support for merge. Uh, so what is merge? Well, first of all, uh, merge is not a replacement for on-conflict. Right? You can somewhat solve similar problems with merge as you did with on-conflict, but they really are different problems, there are different solutions. You can use merge to solve the on-conflict problem, but it's kind of show-horning it in. And you can use on-conflict to serve part, uh, solve part of the merge problem, but that's also really shoehorning it in. On-conflict is designed for upsert. Right? The specific insert, on-conflict ignore or on-conflict update, sorry, on-conflict do nothing is what we ended up saying. Merge is for merging. And the scary thing about merge, which a lot of people don't realize, and this is, I think this is actually written in the SQL standard, that it's okay that merge is not atomic. And the whole point of this on conflict technology is that it is atomic. Like you cannot get a unique violation if you use the on conflict syntax on your inserts. In merge, yes, you can get unique violations if there is concurrent activity that changes the table while you're running. Uh, but what it does, it's great for merging a data set with another data set. It could be you're, you know, you're loading more data into your system and you, well, you want to merge it with whatever data you have there. The basics of how merge works is that it joins, it, it talks about a target and a source. And it joins them together and it defines a set of rules for how to transform the data from the source into the target. It can modify the target or it can add to the target. Uh, it can't actually delete from the target the way that it is now. Uh, so a simple example of how this looks. So we start by saying merge into target. Okay, target here is a, a table name, of course. We say merge into the target. We're going to alias this as T because then it fits on the slide. Uh, and then we say using changes. So that's our source table. We're saying, okay, take the changes that are in my, my changes table and merge them into my target table. And then we have a join clause. On t.typeid, so on the target's type ID uh, column is the same as the changes type ID. Right? This is the join clause of joining the target and the source. And then we define a couple of rules. So we say when not matched, so we're saying when the join clause did not match, so when the row from the changes didn't exist in the target, and the value delta in the changes is greater than zero, then insert values. Okay, so when the delta is greater than zero and the row didn't exist, insert it into the target with the values of name and delta coming from the changes table. And the rules that are defined on merge are just parsed top to bottom. Uh, okay, so if that was not the case, if either it was matched or if the delta was uh, less than one, or, or less or greater than zero, well then we say, okay, when it's matched, and the value uh, of uh, t.num, which is what we're storing in t, and the delta is greater than zero, then update and update the number. We're here, for example, we're explicitly not, if, if the name has changed, we're not updating the name because maybe we just know that the name is not allowed to change or because we need to fit it on the slide. And finally, we're saying, okay, when matched, so this one, if, if matched and the resulting number is greater than zero, then do this. If it's matched and the resulting number is not greater than zero, then delete. So this is a very simple merge. Right? And you can specify, um, I was gonna talk with the, the developer who wrote this and, and he got the question of how many of these rules can you define? And it's only defined by how long your SQL query can be. It's only limited by how long your SQL query can be. So you can write a gigabyte worth of rules. It will not necessarily be fast if you do that, right? But it will be correct. 
I, I would also be very interested in what you're doing, especially if you write this query by hand. But it's certainly something that could come out of some, some you know, running a mock query auto generator system can generate very, very large queries. I mean, my, my own record, not related to merge, but I did once have to deal with a, a query where the query generated by the system was something like 200 megabytes. I'm impressed that that query ran, but it did in like two seconds, which was not fast enough, but it ran. Uh, so again, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on the merge. You can obviously spend an entire talk just talking about merge. Uh, if you're coming from other database systems, this is one of the big things that Postgres has been missing. Yes, sir, we have a question back there. I, I did say merge can't delete, and I, that's a too much of a simplification. <laughs> there are parts of it, like you can't match on, there is a, a part of the match clause that you can't do, but the plain in the simple straight merge, you can do the delete. Uh, it's in a more complicated system. Uh, we'll look at that one actually, if you come to my talk tomorrow, because that patches in the queue for the next version of Postgres. <laughs> yeah, but yes, you can do the basic delete. Um, okay, moving on, backup and replication. Uh, logical replication in Postgres 15 can now do two-phase commit. So you can replicate prepared transactions. Um, if you're using it, really useful. For most people, you won't care. That's true of most features though. Uh, but it's a, pretty, it's a pretty advanced scenario where you're doing both two-phase commit and uh, logic replication. But we do have it now uh, and that is very useful. Usability, you can now publish all tables in a schema in logical replication. So you can create your publication for all tables in schema. Uh, prior versions, you could say for all tables, and you get them in all schemas, or you would have to provide a list of tables. Uh, this works just like it does for for all tables, which means that it's all current and future tables. So future tables will get automatically added, uh, but you do need to refresh your subscriptions for them to actually show up on the other side. Uh, the two features of logical replication that I'm personally really excited about in Postgres 15 is the ability to do row filtering so you can now create a publication that replicates only rows that uh, fit a certain criteria. So in this case, we're replicating from table XYZ only where the column one has a value greater than 10. So we can do row filtering. This could be like a security filtering, for example. We want to replicate only public data to a database somewhere else or uh, stuff like that. And you can also do column level filtering. So you can replicate only certain columns of a table. Previously, we would replicate the whole table. Now you can slice your way both ways, say, you know, we replicate the user's table, but we don't include the password, and we don't, sorry, we don't include the password hash. We should never include the password anywhere. Uh, but we don't include the password hash, we don't include the email address, maybe, because these are sensitive data, and we can replicate that uh, to a different system that can live in a different security domain. Uh, <coughs> making life a lot easier. Uh, further on the logical replication, uh, we have some more statistics. There's a new view called PG stats subscription stats. Uh, tells you on the subscriber side statistics about how your logical replication is going. Uh, there is a new option uh, that you can set on a subscriber related to that, that is called disabled on error. Uh, the way it works right now is if your subscriber gets an error, say it's replicating data, and you had put some invalid, in, invalid constraint or something on the receiving side, and it failed to insert the data because of a foreign key violation or something like that, Postgres will just get stuck in a loop and retry until you fix the problem. If you turn on this disable on error, then when this happened, it'll just disable that subscription and stop trying. And then you can go in and fix the problem and then re-enable the subscription. Uh, at least avoids a lot of log spam. Um, from things like that. Obviously, these are things that shouldn't happen. Speaking of things that shouldn't happen and features you should never use, except when you really have to use them, right, is you now have the ability to skip a transaction on a subscription. This is really dangerous, right? If you expect your data to be consistent, don't use this unless you really know what you're doing. But it lets you do things, I mean, the idea is it lets you do things like, oh, this. Uh, this, part, uh, this transaction fails to replicate because of something that I know, and I know it's okay. Okay, I'll skip past this. 
but it does let you skip past anything you want. You can put anything in there you want, right? So you say alter subscription, skip, and you give it a new LSN, so a log sequence number, a position in the log, and just say everything be now and this point in time. Just ignore it. Just go. Uh, yes, question in the back. Yeah, go ahead. Um, for the disable on error, when, when it disables it, does that stop the publish publication side as well, the, the buildup of wall and waiting, or does, it, does that still keep... So the question is, does this stop the publication side? No. This just stopped the attempt to apply it. Because you might have another subscriber that's receiving off the same publication, and yeah, the, that one will keep running. Okay. Okay. So yeah, this one, obviously you can. If you skip past parts of your replication, the rest of the replication may also not work, right? Because it may have been relying on things that you just decided to skip. So, but yes, it, it can be a way out of a tricky situation if you really know what you're doing. Uh, but, you know, this is... I feared, oop, I haven't seen too much of that, but I feared this was going to turn into like, you know, we have the PG reset wall command, that far too many people go like, oh, I have any problem with my transaction log, so I'm just going to run PG reset wall, not realizing that that is intentionally corrupting your data. And we are, we've been way too, too so leave on people there. Yes. So one, one question on this as well. Um, so one of the things that I found very annoying relating to logical replication is the difficulty failing over in the event where one server dies and you have to move uh, a logical slot from one server to another. It seems to me that being able to reset the LSN for uh, this might actually be uh, something that would give us some real workarounds in that case. Uh, or is, I mean, th does that kind of match your expectations also? Um, I, th I think, I, I get what you're going to, the, the problem, the lack of, like, the difficulty of failing over in combination with logical replication is a well-known problem uh, with the Postgres logical replication. I don't think this in itself will, I don't think it gets you all the way, uh, but it can give you another tool in a, in a very dirty toolbox uh, for working around that problem, uh, but it doesn't solve it. We need a real solution to the problem, uh, and we don't have that right now. Uh, we have some additions on the base backup side. Postgres can now do uh, server-side compression. If you're using PG base backup today, uh, or well then prior to 15, uh, if you enabled compression, it would send the data uncompressed from Postgres to PG base backup, and the compression would happen in the client process. If they're running on the same server, who cares? But if they're running across the network, the difference here is you can now make it do compression on the server and then send it over to PG base backup. You can even combine it with a client-side decompression if you're, for example, setting up a new replica over a metered connection. You can have the Postgres server compress it, it gets sent over, and then PG Basic Backup decompresses it. Um, it's interesting, uh, for those of us who, who were around, like, there was a time when people paid by the megabyte for their internet connectivity, and then they didn't until they, for example, need a satellite link. I guess potentially unless you're using Starlink, but like all the other, all the major like global satellite link providers, they charge a lot of money for every byte. This can save you a lot of money in those cases. Uh, PG Base Backup has received uh, support for something called Base Backup Targets, where you can just design, so you can run PG Base Backup, the default is the target is client, then the data is sent to the PG Base Backup client. You can also use a target of server where the server writes it directly. Uh, and you can use a black hole, which means you're taking a backup into a black hole. That's really just a testing feature. Like, don't, don't use that. Uh, <coughs> the log archiving part of backups has received support for something called uh, loadable, mo called archive libraries, which are loadable modules. So that instead of having this shell script interface that we have now, which can be a major performance problem if you're generating a large number of uh, transaction log files every second, for example. Postgres will spawn a shell and run a command every time this happens. Uh, in Postgres 15, this can be a loadable module that doesn't have to do all that stuff, and it gives you a richer interface for those developers. Uh, it should be easier to make it reliable. It's worth noticing if any one of you... Feel, well, first of all, these are targeted at the people who are building backup tools. That's Most of you are not those people. 
right? But if you are, also know that Postgres 16 will make some fundamental changes in these APIs. So any of these loadable modules in Postgres 15 that are deployed will need to be updated for Postgres 16 uh, when it comes up. Okay, moving into the last part of performance that everyone likes. We've added support for two new compression method methods, uh, LZ4 and Z standard. This can be used for while compression. Uh, they can be used for base backups on client side and server side. Uh, LZ4 can be used for PG receive wall, but not set standard. I think that's just a case of not being done yet. Uh, likewise, uh, PG dump cannot use these features yet. Uh, but these are things that are coming. Uh, support for this in toast compression was already added in Postgres 14. So it's, it's an ongoing step. Postgres can now do distinct in parallel. Okay, more things in parallel queries, that's great. Uh, this is one of those well-defined ones, right? Uh, we can now use ordered partition scans in more cases. What does that really mean? It just means that things will run faster if you're using list partitions, right? Postgres knows that there's more intelligence throughout the system so that it can reuse advantages. Like it knows that if I scan the partitions in the right order, and I can scan each partition by an ordered index, for example, then the resulting order is still the same. Right? You can, it's knowledge like that. So these are things that you don't need to care about. This one is kind of interesting. We have a smarter planner for monotonic window functions. Did anyone understand what that meant? I think that's what the release notes say. It's like, thank you. What it really means that this is actually a very, uh, useful thing again in a lot of migration things. So monotonic window functions are window functions that will increase or decrease monotonically, and Postgres can do smarter things. The classic thing is this. Anyone who's ever migrated a system from Oracle, for example, if you, the, this is the Oracle way of saying select star from, uh, what am I doing? Select star from G, limit five. Like this is how you write that in Oracle. Uh, so you create a subquery that numbers every row, and then you say where row number less than five. Actually, that would be limit four. Um, and Postgres, this works fine in Postgres, right? It works in Postgres before as well. But in Postgres, we would run the entire uh, subquery to completion and give a number on every single row, and then throw everything except the first four rows away. And this smarter planner for monotonic window functions is that it will register and it'll know and it'll only actually run the first four rows because it, the monotonic part knows that once it's reached five, it will never reach a number lower than five again, so it doesn't have to continue. Uh, of course, I mean, personally, I say, yes, your system will be nicer if you're migrating it from Oracle, if you can just rewrite this to use limit. And the system will actually know even more if you can do that. But if you have a few thousand queries in your system that are using the syntax, which is not um, particularly unlikely when you're coming from Oracle, uh, then this can certainly save a lot of work. There are other use cases as well where this optimization will help, but in my experience, this particular thing of migrating systems where this is how we do limit um, has been the really big winner on this one. The Postgres statistics subsystem has been completely rewritten. This is the one about usage statistics. So uh, we used to have a statistics collector process, right? and we would send uh, statistics information to it using UDP over localhost. This is why Postgres wouldn't start if you didn't have a working localhost. Uh, it doesn't do that anymore. It's now stored in shared memory, uh, much less overhead. The stats collector process is gone. Right? So this is no longer a problem. If your system starts and there is no longer a stats collector, that just means you upgrade it. Uh, if you did that previously, a different problem. This means, uh, and we will see some of that coming up in newer versions of Postgres as well, given we have lower overhead in the statistics system, we'll be able to add more statistics uh, for you to look into your system and see how it works. Uh, the user interface of this has not changed. So your queries are still the same to view the statistics info. Uh, we now do prefetch during recovery. Uh, using uh, F-Advice, as it's called. Basically, we will initiate asynchronous I.O. for future while. This is operating system dependent. It's only supported on some operating systems, the ones we generally call Linux. Uh, and, like, it's not supported on Windows, for example. Uh, it will just make recovery run faster. This is a, a big problem that people are chopping away at. Postgres recovery is slow. 
this can be a big problem. Uh, and it, this is one of the things that we can do to work on it. Of course, having said that, there's always going to be more. Uh, I know we have a couple of Postgres contributors in the room, and at this point I usually like to say, you know, if I didn't pick your feature, I'm sorry, but we are running out of time. You can't add them all. There are hundreds of things uh, in each Postgres version. There's a lot of small fixes. There are a lot of performance improvements, all sorts of things like that. Uh, I'm going to skip by my traditional please help uh, slide because that one says please help and download the beta versions. There is no beta version. We're in production. We're, we have put out two minor releases. Just go upgrade and you'll get to enjoy all of these lovely features. Uh, and with that, I say thank you for paying attention and opening the floor up to any questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Magnus. Any questions? Not included in Postgres 15. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so, so are you working with the managed uh, cloud providers like Google Cloud to know? And do you have like an estimated timeline of when those cloud providers put out the version 15? So we are not actively working. We have a number of the uh, cloud providers. The big cloud providers are employing people working in the Postgres community. So in that regard, we are working with the, with the cloud providers, but we don't have like an, a release synchronization or, or anything like that uh, with of them. I think most of them have put out 15 by now. So yeah, Azure and Amazon at least are out on 15. Google is not yet? Okay. okay. Yeah, G Google is in this regard the one that is by far the least represented in the Postgres community, right? There is a lot of people from uh, AWS that are also active in the Postgres community. There are a lot of people from uh, Azure who are also active in the Postgres community. And I think there is like one person from Google Cloud who's semi-active in the Postgres community, right? They're, they're much more over on their own side. So we know a little bit less about that. But in general, for uh, AWS and Azure, we also don't have any any release synchronization, so we will not be able to tell you when they will put out their versions. All right. Any other questions? So thank you, Magnus. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So our thank you. Our next talk is at 11 a.m. So stay around here, please. Thank you.